Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship on this, the 24th of May. And as we, as we begin our worship, we recognize that this is God's land and God's spirit dwells here in the great Southland. As we meet, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land under God and we commit ourselves afresh to working for reconciliation. Today is Ascension Sunday, and that means it's the final Sunday of the season of Easter. Christ has been raised from the dead and has now ascended to heaven, where he sits at God's right hand. It's also Chaplaincy Sunday, so today we'll be thinking especially of all those who serve God through a variety of capacities as chaplains. And, as, and so today we're going to be using parts of the liturgy uh, that have been prepared especially for today. So please join me. Eternal God, we come again, we come again, seeking, hoping, wanting to hear your word. We come because despite our best efforts, we have failed to live by bread alone. We come impelled by a desire too deep for words, with longings that are too infinite to express. We come yearning for meaning in our existence and for purpose for our lives. We come acknowledging our need for each other's affirmation and encouragement, understanding and love. We come confessing our dependence on you, so, Lord, embrace us with your forgiveness and claim us by the mystery and depths of your love. Amen. So as we light our candle today, we recognize that Jesus, the Ascended One, is still the one who accompanies us on our journey, even through these difficult days of the pandemic. We light this candle to celebrate his presence with us at all times. He alone can turn our darkness into light. Please join me as we pray. Glory to you, reconciling God. We come to you today with thanksgiving and praise. Draw us closer to you, that we may be closer to each other, and closer to each other, that we may be closer to you. As we seek your blessing for this time of worship as a dispersed congregation, we pray for other congregations who will gather today using various forms of technology. We are also thankful that we've been able to continue worshiping and we look forward to the day when we will be able to come together again face to face. So help us experience your presence with us today wherever we are and bless this time of worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we invite you now, if you're able, to stand wherever you are and join us in our first hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Let's sing it out. Christ the Lord is risen today.
In Psalm 68, and there are some responses for you. Sing to God. Sing praises to God's name. Prepare a way for him who rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord. Be glad in his presence. God who lives in his sacred temple cares for orphans and protects widows. He gives the lonely a home to live in and leads prisoners out into happy freedom. But rebels will have to live in a desolate land. O oh God, when you led your people, when you marched across the desert, the earth shook and the sky poured down rain because of the coming of the God of Sinai, the coming of the God of Israel. You caused abundant rain to fall and restored your worn out land. Your people made their homes there. In your goodness, you provided for the poor. Sing to God, kingdoms of the world. Sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the sky, the ancient sky. Listen to him, shout with a mighty roar. Proclaim God's power. His majesty is over Israel. His might is in the skies. How awesome is God as he comes from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He gives strength and power to his people. Praise God. So we're going to do that now as we sing that beautiful doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Ascension Day, please join me in this Ascension Prayer and our prayers of confession. Lord Jesus Christ, risen and ascended, the Word made flesh, before all, in all, and beyond all. For the lives you have given us and the gift of the eternal, we praise you. For all the opportunities, the challenges, the experiences, and the achievements life offers us, we praise you. For all the things we can think and do and see and touch, hear and feel, smell and taste, we praise you. Lord Jesus Christ, Lamb of the world and suffering servant, heavenly King, for the love that surrounds us each day through family and friends, the fellowship of the church, and the inner presence of your Holy Spirit, we praise you. Lord Jesus, we pray that we, you will forgive us because we have not lived our lives to the full. We have taken its wonder for granted and we have failed to appreciate its potential. We've lost sight of the abundant life you offer. For offering us life despite all that, we praise you. Forgive us that we have not responded fully to the love shown to us. We have allowed it to be poisoned through discord and division. We have starved it of nourishment through failing to offer our love in return. And we have closed our hearts to all you would offer us. For loving us despite all that, we praise you. Forgive us that we have not begun to grasp your lordship. We have not kept our sense of awe and wonder before you. We have left, let our vision become stilted and we have offered worship that is half-hearted, reflecting our weakness rather than your glory. For calling us despite that, we praise you. So forgiving, Lord, we open our hearts to you today as we worship you. For all you are, all you have done, and all you have yet to do, we praise you this day and forever. 
Amen. So sisters and brothers in Christ, know this for certain. There is no sin that lies outside the remedy of God's love on the cross. There is no evil that cannot be conquered by the power of the risen, ascended Lord. To those who turn from darkness to light, there is forgiveness and a new day. So accept from the hands of God the free gift of liberation and healing. It is yours for the taking. Thanks be to God. So in the light of that forgiveness, I invite you now to share the peace. If you're with other people, uh, you might like to do that. Otherwise, you might like to think of somebody that you'd like to send that peace to today. So the peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. So this week, uh, Reverend Janet is having a well-earned uh, break, and uh, so we are hoping she's had a, a wonderful time of refreshment. Um, and also next week, next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and normally if we were here together, we'd all be wearing red. So I'm going to invite you, if you've got something red, you might like to wear that next Sunday or have something red uh, near, near you as we celebrate uh, the, the beginning of the church in, in Pentecost. Today, uh, our family cross, we'd like to give this to Margaret Munro. As you know, Margaret is one of our musicians and she's been a very, very faithful member of this congregation for a long time. So Margaret, we'll make sure this gets to you. And would you please remember to pray for Margaret um, in this coming week? So let's listen now to our scriptures. Reading today from John chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them and they have received them and know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world but on behalf of those whom you gave me because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. Our second reading comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 14. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, 
and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This is Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven. will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. So as we prepare our hearts and minds to listen to the message that will be brought to us today by Reverend Glenn, let's sing our next hymn, Break Now the Bread of Life. everybody. For Father's Day last year, one of my daughters, perhaps a little bit cheekily, gave me a new bestseller book called Dad's Jokes. I'm not sure if there was a subtle message in that, sending me a hint to improve my repertoire. I won't go down that road right now. But during this COVID-19 period of lockdown or self-isolation and so on, I have to admit it, I found it a little bit uplifting to each day read one da dad's joke, or occasionally two if I need to. So, and then I thought to myself, why should all you people miss out on this titillating joy? So I've got a dad joke for you this morning. A pessimist sees a dark tunnel. An, opt an optimist sees a light at the, dark, at the end of a dark tunnel. A realist sees a freight train. The train driver sees three idiots standing on a railway track. I know it's probably just that small things amuse small minds, especially when you've been locked up like we've all been locked up for quite a while. But I have to tell you, I really had a little light bulb moment when I read that dad's joke a couple of days ago. I've been wrestling with this rather strange story that is at the end of the Gospels in each of them in their, its own way. It's very brief and it goes by the very unexciting title, The Ascension. I was trying to make sense of it and think what I could share with you today. You remember it's the story, we heard it just a few moments ago, where Jesus is standing with some friends 
he shares some last words with them and then after saying goodbye he just disappears in a cloud and just when I thought that this strange almost scientific-esque sort of story was getting the better of me along came this dad joke now I know you'll want me to explain how on earth that was helpful so I will do that that joke if you remember it from just a few moments ago had three men standing together on a railway track standing there in the same place at the same moment in time looking in the same direction and they all saw something totally different to each other from that same spot and that's the bit that hit home to me now that's strange that's not funny and I was wondering, I don't know what you immediately think is, I wonder which one's looking at the right thing. wonder if any of them are seeing what they're supposed to be seeing. And we know we're being set up for the punchline that's going to arrive in another moment or two. But I'll come back to that in a moment. Those three men standing there like that, looking ahead and seeing totally different things had a connection with me and I thought of the disciples of Jesus that I've been reading up on and thinking a whole lot about again in this last week or two and I thought boy they are a whole lot like those three men standing on the railway track and I thought a little bit more about that they've all been through the same horrible even totally traumatic experience in the last month six weeks or so they've gone through that together they're in the same moment in history they stand they're together in much the same part of the world all there as followers who've watched Jesus go through go to hell and back we would say and here they are all together looking forward wondering where on earth is this leading for us? What's coming next? Where are we to go? What are we to be doing? And very sadly for them, very, in a very difficult, tough way, I'm assuming it must have been, the pieces just were not falling properly together for them. They were doing things, but you could tell in the accounts they are pretty anxious about what it's all going to mean. So I want to return again to the imagery of that joke. I'm not laughing anymore like I was when I first heard it. And I, myself anyway, as I thought very carefully about them, I pictured some of them just like those three different people on the railway track. Some of these early followers of Jesus, his good friends, were no doubt very pessimistic come this point in time they were looking ahead missing Jesus feeling pretty hopeless and it must have looked like the future was journeying into a dark tunnel not a very inviting place to go others were I imagine a little bit more optimistic and perhaps they were by nature those sorts of people and they see a faint light in the distance through that dark tunnel. It's a long way away. They don't yet have any idea what it'll really mean for them or what it'll look like in practical terms. But it gives them a little sense of hope that down the track things are going to be better for us. And they are hanging on to that hope. And others, though, are probably like we can identify with as well, some of us, we'd probably say boringly realistic and pragmatic about everything. They've taken stock of what horrible things they've been through together in these last couple of months, in a whirlwind couple of months. They look at it and think, well, it's happened. We can't do anything about it. We better count our losses, take stock, move on and do the best we can with what we've got. But they've got no time for theologizing, trying to get deep meanings in it all. They've got no time for dreaming because you're too busy trying to work out how we're going to survive from here on. 
they do see the big train in the tracks, but they don't have any idea what this means or why it's there. And then into this, I see the punchline coming. And I thought maybe that train driver who's bearing down in the freight train on the mall is just a little bit like God, looking down on this motley bunch of disciples, dear friends of his, and he's looking down on them and probably with a wry grin on the side of his mouth thinking, have these per people not understood anything of what all this was about while it was happening? Don't they see that there's a, a big train pouring down on them, but it's a train of change and hope? Where are they? What's going on? And I'm sitting there at home a little smugly thinking, weren't they a little bit dense back there in those first days? But it doesn't take long before the, the penny drops. The deepest cut of all was when I realised we are not any bit different to those disciples 2,000 years ago. We also are following the same Jesus and we also are living in times of enormous change and, and fear and uncertainty in our world at the moment. We're a motley bunch of disciples and as far as I can tell, we're also like those three men on the track with lots of different ideas spinning through our heads. And this is all around the world, Christians doing it, wondering where on earth this is going to take the church and God's people. And I know there are some Christians in the world looking at this same situation, we're all in together, and they are horribly pessimistic about it. They're very worried about where the church is going to be after all this is gone. They're worried about lots of churches going bankrupt. They're worried about members drifting away and never coming back again and on and on. And there are some other Christians who are a lot more, a bit more upbeat and a fair bit more optimistic, but still can't see where it's all going to lead us, but really praying and dreaming that out of all this the church will be refreshed around the world maybe some of those things that were cluttering what we were doing that were not much help to god's work in the world they might get put aside and we might find some new things that we need to know to be a better church everywhere in today's changing world and there are some others who are very pragmatic about it all and they just look at what's happened can't do anything about it we better just pick up the pieces and try and get back to what we've been doing and get on with things as best we are able quite a mixed bunch of responses and none of them really full of clarity or direction yet and that may be some time before we get to that place and i imagine God must be looking down or watching over all his people in his church today. And again, we must look to him a little bit foolish at times. And he must wonder what God has to do to get through to us that there is a big train of hope and even through all these changes that's bearing down on us and we do not need to be quite so fearful. So this all brings us back now, you'll be relieved, to the ascension story that has been the focus in today's readings. I've come to appreciate this story a lot more than I once did. It's a much more strategic and pivotal story, albeit a very brief, short little story, albeit right near the end of the Gospels, and here they are, the book about Jesus is almost finished. And it's as if they've, for a moment, paused, almost hit a little wall, and they're face to face with a question that doesn't go away and which they know's got to be addressed. What happens now? Where to from here with Jesus? What next? And it's at that point, the ascension story finds its place. 
and it becomes a fairly vital link in the gospel stories from the past into the present where we are living. So there were just a couple of points that really, really struck me this time and I'll just share two things with you. The first message is obvious but Jesus is now gone. More is going to be up to us and we have to get used to that. Now I'm not disputing in that spiritual sense that Jesus isn't gone, he's still here, he's alive and he's with us, but in the physical sense he's gone. It's very different now and the ascension story is much more down to earth and it's saying to the followers of Jesus you've got to rise to the occasion now because you are Jesus in the world in practical terms. We are the face of our Lord in the world and that's quite a daunting thought. You can't underrate how important this little story is to understand that now we are Jesus' hands, we are Jesus' feet, we are Jesus' eyes, we are Jesus' ears in the world, we are Jesus' compassion, carers in the world, we are Jesus' justice doers in the world, we are Jesus' dirty hands helpers in the world, we are the face that people will look to and as they look to us as followers of Jesus that will determine what they decide to do with Jesus. If we stuff up as we often do and will do because we are just human the image of Jesus, the standing of Jesus in the world takes another hit and it becomes that little bit harder for someone else somewhere to see and find Jesus. If you don't believe this all matters really, that it's just theoretical gobbledygook, just stop and think what big hit Jesus and the church and Christian faith has taken in the world in the last couple of decades, particularly the last decade, in light of all the scandals over child abuse, pedophile clergy all around the world, the world has noticed that and the world is tarring the Christian message and gospel with that sort of image. So this little story has a pretty powerful message to us all. We are still the face of Jesus. It matters what each of us do, not to be perfect, but to be honest and real in presenting Jesus. The second thing then follows on from that and it's a pretty big thing as well to come to terms with. We have to learn to see change as an opportunity, not as a threat. When Jesus died and was no longer physically present with all those disciples of his back there in the world as it was 2,000 years ago, it's very hard for us to really imagine how traumatic, how grief-stricken, how hard it must have been for those people. But they did pick up the baton gradually, bit by bit. They got it all together. They made some mistakes. They picked up the pieces and they kept on with it. And that little church in Jerusalem gradually spread further and further afield as they set about being the face of Jesus in a new way in the world. So in 20 to 2020, we've come face to face with an, another generation of cataclysmic change. Who of us at Christmas time could have imagined that there was anything in the world other than a huge world war that might bring the whole planet to its knees? But we found out there are such things as that and the world we live in has taken a big hit, a confidence hit. And probably to me, the biggest damage or effect of it all is that we in our generation have had to face that we aren't masters of everything in this world. 
we are still vulnerable to many things that we can't automatically fix despite our medical advances, our technologies and all the superb things that we think we are in control of, there are still a lot of things that we can't do and that vulnerability, that fearful vulnerability has risen up to the surface again in our world. This pandemic is a big challenge and it will be with us in its aftermath for a long time to come. And it's certainly challenging us as Christians to look again at how we present the message of our Lord to this sort of world we're in. On top of that, the church has been under siege anyway for a long time before this pandemic came. In my lifetime, I've seen it shift away from being at the centre of the community. I can remember when the Courier-Mail reported highlights from Sunday sermons around Brisbane every week in their paper and they'd report the synods or the conferences in great detail. Now, nobody wants to hear that anymore. We're there on the sidelines and the periphery for so many people. It's a big challenge that we're facing in our changing world, like the freight train coming down the train line. But it is a train that brings change and hope if we keep focused on our Lord. How do we embrace these changes? What will it mean? None of us know all those answers yet, but Christians have done it before throughout the turbulent history the church has lived through. They've worked out answers in new situations. It's often been very painful, but they've done it. They'll do it again. We have to do it again. So Ascension, to sum it all up for me, is saying we've got to see this change as we are facing today in our world as an opportunity where there will be new things we can do for God and with God and with our Lord in the world. Rather than shrinking away, cowering in fear and defensiveness, it's inviting us to get ready, to be ready, whenever our Lord leads us to a new day together. Now, just in case all of that has been just a little bit heavy going, in this COVID-19 self-isolation world that we're still living in, where I have to say we've all been not only confined to our homes, we've been confined a lot closer to our refrigerators and our pantries and is good for our health. So I have one parting dad joke for you. This is in the diet diary and it's day one. I removed all the fattening food from the house. It was delicious. Amen. Peace be with you. Thank you, Glenn, for that message. And um, kids, we haven't forgotten about you. Uh, the segment this week has been done by Debbie and that will be on that separate uh, spot for you. So we hope you are enjoying uh, these uh, things that we're doing for you each week. So as we come to our time of offering now, we want to thank you for the ways that you have been faithful in continuing to give. Some of you are doing that online. Some of you are dropping in your envelopes to the office and we just want to say a huge thank you to you for that. We really appreciate it and that is enabling us, of course, to continue in the ministry that we're trying to provide, not only here but uh, also further afield. So let us now bring to God our gifts as we bring our offering. So please join me now in prayer. Loving God of all times and seasons, we offer ourselves, our time, our talents and our gifts to you in thanks and gratitude. And we pray that all we offer 
would help to enable your message of love and forgiveness to be shared broadly in your world and our local communities. Amen. Let us bring our prayers for ourselves and others. Let us pray. Loving God, who still calls us together in different ways, we come knowing you listen and bless all your children. Today we come to bring our thanks. Thank you for wise leadership in our government and churches, and we pray you will continue to guide and give wisdom to all our leaders. We pray for leaders, decision makers and advisers in nations around the world during the pandemic, civil disturbance and natural disasters. Help them work together in wisdom and justice. We pray for breakthroughs in knowledge about the virus for researchers. May they work in safety and in cooperation with each other. As we enjoy our relative security and comfort, we remember many whose need is overwhelming. Within our own community, we pray your blessing on those struggling financially, especially those who have lost their jobs. We think of casual workers, refugees, international students and other visa holders, and we pray for agencies trying to assess these your people and ongoing generosity from our governments. We pray for families who have been stressed over being all at home, trying to balance work and schooling. May the return to school tomorrow ease their difficulties. And we pray for vulnerable members of our community with chronic illness or disability who have become particularly isolated. Help them to make and keep social contacts. We pray for those who work in frontline services, hospitals, emergency and community services, schools and residential care. Please bless and care for them. We remember chaplains who work in these areas, seeking to bring comfort and encouragement. Grant them wisdom and keep them safe. In particular, we pray for our two local churches school chaplains, Ash and Justine, and their school communities. Looking further afield, we pray for refugee and displaced people around the world, and for the aid agencies trying to provide food, medical aid and education. We have heard this week that COVID-19 has been discovered in the Rohingya camps in Bangladesh. So we pray especially for that situation, to limit the spread of illness and to find these hundreds and thousands of people a safe home. Today makes, marks the beginning of the week of prayer for Christian unity. Loving and merciful God, you hear the cry of the poor and stretch out your hand to save them. Look upon our world in its need. Give courage to those facing an uncertain future and hope to those weighed down by fear and anxiety. May our churches, by acts of unusual kindness, be living witnesses to the power of your love. May we grow together in unity and peace to the glory of your name so that the world may believe. And now let us pause to remember any in special need who are known to us alone. We pray silently. Even as we have prayed for others, Lord, we pray for ourselves. Move us beyond words to compassion and beyond compassion to action. Amen. 
So as our service draws to a close, we invite you to join in our last hymn, which is really a prayer. O breath of God. So hear this word of mission. Eternal God, when we respond to your call, you sweep us into that movement that takes the good news to the ends of the earth. You have commissioned us to be the people of God in every nation and every area of life, in local issues and international affairs, in the suburb and the ghetto, in city and outback. outback. And now the benediction. So let us go with the strength that God gives us. Go simply, go lightly, go gently. Go in search of love and the Spirit go with you. Amen.